Okay, everyone, I think it's uh, time for us to get started. Um, so uh, welcome to this, the uh, third of our uh, Lunch and Learn uh, sessions in this series. Um, I'm uh, delighted to be um, uh, uh, joined today uh, by um, uh, Dan McGid and uh, from um, uh, Aradani. Uh, who will be telling us today uh, all about really uh, high performance resilient APIs for your IBM I using Kafka. <sighs> and I now have to go catch my breath. But before we do that, I will be talking to you a little bit about indexing on IBM I. So I will be doing that for about 15 minutes at the start. And uh, then I'm going to hand over to uh, Dan and uh, Aaron. And uh, then I will do another sort of 15 minutes on indexing uh, towards the end uh, of the session. Uh, a couple of little things just on uh, practicalities here. Uh, if you have any questions, will you please put them in the Q&A as opposed to the chat? So we will be keeping an eye on the Q&A. So the chat is just there for chat. And by the way, everybody who's been saying hello, hello back to you. Um, so uh, one of the nice things, you can hear me. <laughs> So, um, okay, so please put them into the Q&A. Uh, we will be keeping an eye on them, and your question may well be answered directly in the Q&A, or if I spot it, uh, might just answer it uh, in passing. Um, okay, so without further ado, uh, let me move on to talking about indexing on IBM I. Now, indexing on IBM I uh, can be a very complex uh, topic, so since I have about 30 minutes to talk about it, this is just very much an introduction to it and hopefully to give you a highlight of things that you may need to go and uh, check at a later stage. So to begin with, um, let's just talk about what indexing is primarily for. And the main reason that we have indexing is for use uh, by the SQE optimizer. So any SQL that runs on the system, and here we're talking, I think, uh, primarily um, about select statements, though it does apply to just about all SQL. The SQE optimizer is what handles that, or the SQE engine, if you want, is what handles all of that um, uh, on the system. So regardless of where a request comes from, whether it be in within run SQL scripts, embedded SQL, uh, through PHP, from Java running on some other platform or in a portal or whatever. It makes absolutely no difference. It all goes to the same place. Um, so the main reason that we create uh, indexes is for use by the optimizer, is to give the optimizer choice. So the opti what the optimizer uses is access paths. And so Access paths come into existence in a number of ways. If you define key constraints, um, whether they be primary key, unique key, um, or foreign key constraints on tables, they result in an access path. If you have keyed physical files or keyed logical files, they result in access paths. And of course, then we have indexes, which is where you can really, really create access paths. In other words, we can do things in access paths with indexes that go beyond what we can do in key constraints or physical or logical files. So indexes on IBM I, there are two types of index. The first of these is binary radix. Now a binary radix is what is the traditional indexing system that has always been on the system. So um, it has always been a form of binary radix that has been in our database since the system 38 in 1979, okay? And this is what is known as a hybrid tree structure, uh, the way that it works. Now, binary radix, and the hint here, by the way, is in the word binary, means that it is a very, very fast indexing system that's going on. The way most of us visualize an index is that we think that the index is, well, it's a key, you know, so it would be like an 80 character key, say, and some sort of a pointer to where that row is in the table. And the index is kept in order by that key. Now, this is a good way to visualize it, 
but it bears very little resemblance to what's actually happening underneath the covers. Okay, so for example, let's say I had a table with a million rows and an 80 character key. And let's say for 500,000 of those rows, the first 80 characters of the key is the exact same. And for the other 500,000 uh, rows in the table, the first uh, 50 characters of the key, or sorry, first 40 characters of the key is the exact same, okay? Now, this isn't sort of a million times 40 that's kept in the index for those. It's actually a bit test. So the system sort of, you know, what's in there is logic in the index that says, you know, if, if the fourth bit of the third byte is on, it's one of these 500,000. If it's off, it's one of these 500,000. So this is why it's pretty much impossible to calculate what the size of a binary radix index is going to be, or a binary radix access path, because it depends on what the actual values are as to how complex the bit comparisons are going to be. The second type that we have is an EVI, an encoded vector index. And this is a variation of bitmap indexing. Um, and, and this method, this implementation of bitmap indexing is unique to IBM I. You get it nowhere else. Okay. And the main place that we use these EVIs is when we have low cardinality in a table. Now, low cardinality means that you have a column and in that column, that regardless of how many rows you have, there are very few values that you will have in there. So an, exact, an, an excellent example of this would be something like a state code in the US. So think of this, if I'm Amazon and all the millions of customers that I have in the US, with all of their addresses, there are only 50 possible values that I can have for state. Okay, lots of rows, but low cardinality, okay? Uh, low sequence of values. Okay, and we'll be talking about where, where we use the, all of these in, in a second, where we use EVIs on that. Okay, so when we talk about indexes, the sort of first type of index that we use is just simply the one that we're familiar with, which is column value slash sequence. So, you know, it, you know it's employee ID, right? It, is it? Right? So it's really the order by. It's the sequence that we're specifying in the index. But we also have derived key indexes. And a derived key index is where the value that's in the index is derived in some way. So it could be an expression. So I could say, well, the key is the value of the salary plus the commission plus the bonus. That's what the index value is. Or it could be the result of a scalar function. And we will see, um, we will see this uh, a little bit uh, later on, okay? So, uh, so uh, Leza, um, I will be dropping uh, the link for the handouts and that into the chat and that a little bit later on, okay? Um, okay, we also then have uh, what are known as sparse indexes. So a sparse index is one that reduces the number of rows in the index with a where clause. And again, we will see an example of this later on. And then we can have indexes that are for index only uh, access. So this would be um, where if I have a select statement, um, the optimizer can actually get all of the information it requires directly from the index without ever going near the rows in the table. Okay. Um, okay, so a question there from Shahid, how does index differ from logical files and what advantage does it bring compared to logical files or other access pass creation methods. Okay, we're going to see all of these, Shahad, hopefully when we go through, but I've just mentioned some of them here. So for example, a derived key index, it's impossible to do that in a logical file, okay? Where clauses, yeah, you can do that sort of logic with select omit logic and logical files, but with an index, I've got a complete where clause, including all of the scalar functions in there. So, uh, you know, I mean, the, a logical file um, compared to an index, um, I would describe a logical file as a child's three wheel bicycle, and I would describe an index as being an 18 wheel truck, okay, in, in terms of what you can define and, and do with them. Okay. Now, an important point, though, um, 
to, to note about indexes is they're not just for a sequence and an order by, okay? And they are not unique keys. This is something we were very used to in logicals that nearly everything we defined was a unique key. This is not the case um, with, uh, uh, with indexes and you, and you shouldn't think of them like that, okay? So they are not just for sequence. And again, we'll, we'll talk about that a, a little bit later on. So index uses then, we do use them for native IO. So if I define an index, I can put that index in a declare file in an RPG program and use it, you know, exactly as if it was a, um, uh, a uh, you know, a logical file uh, per se. So I can use it um, uh, to, to uh, do direct uh, native processing in RPG. Okay, but the main use of indexes is used to identify and process rows in a table. So this is when the optimizer goes to optimize a select statement. It uses it for selection. So it will look for indexes to help it with the where clause. It will use indexes for joining. If you've got join logic in your select statement, it will use them for grouping and then it will use them for ordering. So not just for ordering, not just for the sequence, but also for the where clause, the group, you know, the, the having clauses, uh, joining and grouping. They are also used for statistical information. And we're going to see this a little bit later on when we're going to see an index that's actually advised, but it's advised only um, uh, for um, uh, statistical uh, information uh, for analysis. Okay, we've got two main strategies that we follow then when it comes to indexing. Uh, proactive and reactive, <clears throat> and usually it's a combination of the two. So proactive is when you design your database, you decide I'm going to put as many indexes in place so that we can hit the ground running when people start to hit hit the database with SQL. Um, now a very good place to look for this and you know what index I should be building is to have a look at the views that you're defining. Okay, because you should have lots and lots and lots of views. And in there in the views, when you look at the sort of where logic and everything like that, it gives you a good idea um, uh, of what to do. Uh, reactive is when the system is up and running. And it's not, okay, so the extreme of this is when somebody runs an SQL statement and the lights in the building dim. Um, so you go and you say, mm, maybe I should create indexes if we're going to run that SQL statement again. That would be the extreme of it. But it would be that as, as new views and that are created, you should be looking at uh, creating those um, uh, indexes, okay? So you will always be doing reactive um, indexing in there. Just how much you do depends on how proactive uh, you are at the start. Now, the nice thing about this is that as you do this, uh, like or as you run SQL on the system, the optimizer does recommend indexes to you. It does say, by the way, if I'd had this index here, I would have been able to do this quicker. And you can now have a decision, you know, whether or not you create those uh, those indexes. Okay. All of that information, by the way, is in one of the system catalogs, and that one there, SysIX ADV. But the way most of us access it, um, the index advisor, is through ACS. Now you can do this at a system level, at a schema slash library level or if you want for an individual table. Okay, if you just right click on any of those, you will see the option for index advisor and in you go for advised indexes. Now, by the way, this is not the default layout for it. This is my customized layout uh, for it. And um, these are all of the columns that you have. So for a table, for this table called for index, which we'll be looking at in the second half, it's saying, you know, here's, what was advised and here's why it was advised the main sort of columns you're interested in are the advise key when was the first and last time that the index was advised how many times was it advised okay the longest and average execution times there were when people um were running queries for what that for when that index was advised how long it thinks it would take to create the index okay how many rows were in the table when it last recommended it? 
know, so you got to, I mean, this is the thing you would bear in mind if, if you know, it recommended this, this index, but you would actually just purge the table and delete it 90% of the rows, yeah, maybe you don't need it anymore, okay? And then why was it advised? Was it for row selection or was it for ordering or grouping that it recommended? Now, there's this lovely option that they and added to this, which is called condensed advised indexes which are a, um, where they will take multiple of these advised indexes and sort of just push them into one. So if one index is a subset of the other, it just shows you one advised index as opposed to two, okay, which is kind of nice. Um, this is just shows you these, all the different selections you can do within the index advisor, okay, for what columns you want to see, the sequence you want them in, and then these two sets of option here, the general and the date and time ones, if you want to subset the rows. So I only want to see what's been advised in the last week, for example. You can also get to this from the uh, plan cache. So if the SQL statement is still actually in the plan cache, you can see advised index information in there as well for something that is sort of still semi-active. There are services available to help you with um, indexes. So these ones here, act on index advice, remove indexes and reset index statistics. Okay, so that was just a general overview of what indexing is, the type of things. What we're going to see in the second section when we come to it in, in just a few, in sort of in about 40 minutes or so, is some of creating some indexes that are not advised and looking at things like derive key indexes and indexes only for that and seeing the impact uh, that they have. Okay, so I am going to stop sharing my screen now. And uh, Dan, I will hand over to you. Great. Thanks, Paul. I appreciate it. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, can hear you perfectly, sir. Great. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. And I assume you can see the screen. So yes, I can see, see it. it absolutely fine. Yep. <laughs> okay, terrific. Great. Okay, so so uh, that, that's, I, I love the, the combination of these two things. You know, because as Paul is talking a lot about sort of uh, the, the traditional things you do on the IBMI and, and for managing data. And really what I'm going to be talking about is just a, a, another option, another way to handle data using some of the, the, the modern technology available in this thing called Kafka. So, and I'm going to start out with the basics. So we're going to look at, you know, why would you want, why do you care? You know, what, what do you, what do you care about Kafka? Why is it important? And then I'll talk about the architecture of Kafka and some of the terminology. So you'll be familiar with that. I'll go through some specific IBMI use cases. So some real world use cases of, of Kafka with the IBMI. And then Aaron is going to do a quick demo of a sample Kafka application for the IBMI. And if you've ever sat in on my presentations, you know we're going to, I'm going to cover a whole lot of territory very, very fast. So I, we will be, uh, I, you'll get links to the recording so you can review later. And we will also provide you with the handouts. So basically, we're talking to many, many IBMI customers today, and it's more and more every day, who want to be able to tie their IBMI into the wider IT ecosystem, whether it's with other platforms in their own in, in enterprises, or if they're trying to connect with their partners and their customers, they want to be able to talk to those things either from their IBMI or give those other outside users access to their IBMI resources. So they're trying to create these connections and create some kind of middleware that allows them to talk in and out. And there, there are different options for how to do this. The most popular ones we see out there are, are REST and then this new growing environment of Kafka. So just a real quick uh, primer kind of differences between REST and Kafka is REST uses things you're, you're probably familiar with. So it's using all the HTTP methods, get, put, patch, delete. So you're creating APIs that allow you to access things using those standard REST or those standard HTTP methods. It's relatively easy to set up and use. It has very low latency for individual small messages that you might be setting in, sending in, and you can connect it in a variety of ways to the IBMI. The problem with REST is when you start getting up into higher volumes uh, of, of API calls or large message payloads, 
it starts to break down it starts to slow down and it, and it it can't it sometimes can't keep up with the performance requirements you might have and that's where kafka comes in kafka is really designed for very very high speed processing for what are called message streams that is just data that is just constantly coming in so it's 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 not that you've got a, a transaction batch of things you need to you need to process it's the data just keeps coming in and so Kafka is designed to deal with those kinds of message, message streams. And it's designed to give you real-time processing. So as the messages come in, you can do things right away. So you get very, very real-time data. And customers are replacing a lot of their batch processes and their, their extract, trans, uh, transform, and load processes for analytics. They're replacing with Kafka messaging. So they get that really real-time information. Kafka can handle very large data loads, so you can have you know big binary files in a Kafka message. And we're going to talk a little bit about this, but it's built. It has built-in resilience so that it stays up and running all the time, and it uses a a pub sub event driven architecture. So, and I'll talk about that as well. It's, it, and it's more complex to set up and use than than a REST environment. This is from the Apache Kafka Foundation. It's uh, it's it's the definition. Apache Kafka is a high performance, resilient, open source based, event driven streaming pub sub messaging application for providing loosely coupled connections between a variety of message producers and consumers. And there's a huge amount of jargon in there. And by the end of this presentation, you'll know what all of that means if you don't already. Just a little bit about Kafka use. It's being downloaded all the time. There are over a billion downloads from the, the, the open source found from the Kafka Apache Association. It's used by more than 80% of the Fortune 500. The companies that are using it are expanding their use. So there's been 300% growth in the companies that are making large scale use of, of Kafka clusters. LinkedIn is processing 7 trillion messages a day using their, their, Kafka, their Kafka environment. And it is facilitating this move to real-time stream processing rather than batch processing of operations. So let's talk about some of the terminology. So first, first thing is, is, it, is Kafka is an event-driven architecture. Now, event-driven architecture has been around for a very long time. When I was a new IBMI employee long, long, long time ago in Las Vegas, Nevada, I had a, an opportunity to sell a system to one of the big casinos who wanted something to automate their race and sports book, the, the big boards in their, in their casino where you could bet on games. And the problem is, is they were adjusting the point spreads and the odds as people were, were betting because their whole objective is simply to balance how much is being bet on each side. They, don't, they, they want it to be exactly equal because they don't care who wins. They make a fee on every transaction. So every time somebody would bet, they, they were calculating what should the odds be or what should the point spread be. So they had to have this event-driven architecture. So I had the opportunity to sell them either a System 38 or this thing called a Series 1 that IBM used to have. And it turned out that the Series 1 was the right option because it was an event-driven system. It used it, it had a language called the event-driven language, and it had a that its command language was, was called EDX, the event-driven executive. It was an event-driven system. So this you, you, you can imagine dating myself a little bit. This has been around for a long time, this whole idea of event-driven architecture. If you want to think about it, you know, kind of in a 911 situation, you wouldn't want to do procedurally oriented programming for 911 where you're you know, going out and, and polling a database every few minutes to say, gee, are there any emergencies out there? You want to know the moment the emergency arises. So you have this event-driven architecture that says the moment that call comes in, somebody can actually take an action. So the minute it comes in, we're not waiting for somebody to go check to see, are there any emergencies out there? We're handling it as soon as it comes in. So the idea of event-driven, you use it when data delivery is continuous, meaning the data is coming in, you're not getting batches of things that you process together, you're just getting this continuous stream of data, that it's irregular, you don't know when it's gonna come in, and it, it can be unpredictable as to what you're gonna get, what kind of data you're gonna get. And then, it's important when you need to respond as that data comes in. So you need to be able to respond quickly as the data arrives and people are expecting very, very fast response times. Hey, uh, Dan, Sorry. if I can just uh, interrupt you just for one second. Sure, um, yeah, go ahead. I just realized uh, your, your camera's off. Would you, do you want to turn it on? <laughs> ah, okay. There we go. Great. All right, good. Thanks, Eric. That's, that's okay. an example of an event coming in that you need to respond to. Exactly, I had to respond to right away. Okay, so you know, so if you, just to take that to a real world example, so you know, 
the, and we see this all the time where, where customers have these kinds of events coming in. So, and so events are happening and they're storing them in a table somewhere. And then they do a polling approach where they all go out and they'll poll to see, is there any new data? Is there any new data? And, you know, they go out and they do that, you know, every couple of minutes or, you know, once an hour or whatever, but they have a time frame where they're going out and they're checking to see. So it's a procedural approach using polling to say, is there, a, is there data for me? And, and they're, 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 uh, obviously a lot of concerns with that approach if you need this very fast response time. Because one is you've got the delay of the polling. You've got to wait until that polling happens to find out. You also have to look at that data and say, okay, well, which is the new data? So you have to have some algorithm to say, I can recognize what is new since the last time I checked. Is there a new file? Is there new? Are there new records in the database? So I need to have some kind of logic for identifying the updates. And then I need a custom connector for talking to whatever it is I'm going to need to call based on that data. You know, do I have another IBMI program I have to call? Do I want to send a text message out? Do I want to execute a process on a Windows platform or Linux platform? I have to create custom connectors for each one of those things. So I do the poll, find out if there's new data. If there is, then I have these, these processes that are going to execute based on finding that. So the other sort of more appropriate thing or the kind of the IBMI approach to event driven is you put in a database trigger. So you have to say, if the database updates, then I want to perform an action. So, and, and that is kind of, that, that is the, the sort of typical approach to, to event driven kind of programming on the IBMI is, is I put that into the database so that I can then take an action based on that. Uh, the, you still have the issue that once you, you run that trigger, you're going to have to create the connector to whatever it is that you're going to have to run. You don't want to really put up the, the processing logic into the database trigger. So you're going to have some pro external processing logic that you're going to have to go find and run. And it really was triggers were really not designed for the idea that you were going to create this completely event driven architecture around, around your IBM I. So that may be part of your strategy. In fact, it's a great way of identifying things that happen on the IBMI, but there are things you can do to actually make that more powerful. So it's where, what is the alternative to doing those things? So you're going to need that integration. So no matter what you're doing, doesn't eliminate this idea that if I have transactions coming into my e-commerce system and I need to access my warehouse system and update inventory, or I need to go grab some pricing information from my pricing algorithm, or I need to check the customer's credit, I still have to do those integrations. So typically what we do is we write these custom integrations to do all those things where we have to do you know, the authentication, we have to translate the data if it's coming in as JSON data or XML data or common delimited files, we've got to translate it. We've got to route it to the right place. We've got to do all the error handling and the logging. So we're, we're doing that for each of these connections. So there's a lot of work to creating these kind of direct integrations. What the idea of Kafka is, is we don't do it this way. We don't create a bunch of direct integrations. What we do is we create this loosely coupled environment where the event, what's called the event producer or the publisher, says, oh, I've got an event, a new order has just come in, or a truck has just left its uh, its warehouse, or uh, I just got uh, information from my patient on their, their medical condition. So these, these issues are coming in, they get posted to what, what's called a broker, and then the, the users of that information subscribe to it. So I, as the producer, simply post the message, and the users who have subscribed to it and are, are, are authenticated and authorized, get those messages. So that's the idea behind Kafka. And you can have lots and lots of different, I mean, it's practically unlimited, the kinds of producers that you can have. We have, these are some of the ones we've run into, you know, trucking companies that are tracking arrivals and departures and truck status, uh, finance companies that are dealing with finance transactions, healthcare companies that are dealing with information coming in from their patients, uh, in, inventory inquiries, and we're all familiar with using you know, Amazon and, and other sites for doing, for doing order entry. This is a very common thing that people are using event-oriented programming for. Uh, you, it, the, using mobiles, mobile devices, so every time somebody does, clicks on something, we're gonna get a, a message. Those are all different uh, examples of people who are producing messages that might get posted to a Kafka uh, a Kafka broker. So Kafka is basically using this, although with some enhancements, it's using this idea of what's called uh, PubSub or, or Publish Subscribe Architecture. So let's look at that. 
and what that is. So you have these basically these three elements. You have the event producer or the publisher. So somebody who is creating an event that could be a sensor out in the field. You know, it could be a, a blood pressure monitor. It, it could be a, a, a sensor in a truck. It could be, a, a, you know, a, a, an ATM machine, whatever. Some, there are lots and lots of things that might be producing those messages. When that event occurs, they post the, the, the message to the event broker in what are called topics. A topic is simply a way of relating messages. So it might be all of my order inquiries or all of my uh, my uh, patient reports or whatever. You've got a list of related messages and they're 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 uh, gathered together in a topic. And then the, then you have the event consumers, the people who are actually then getting that data and making use of that data. They can subscribe to those topics. So they get that message, they either get that message pushed to them or they get notified that there's a message available to them as those messages arrive into that, into that topic on the event broker. So what you end up with is this decoupled interface, right? So you've got the producers and the consumers, but they don't really care about each other from the perspective of having to worry about, gee, are the consumers making changes to their application? You don't really care. Is the consumer system down? We don't care. Is there, is, are they performing slowly? We don't care. We are simply, as a producer, we're simply posting those messages. The consumers are simply uh, consuming those messages. And the two things are not dependent on each other from the perspective of what's happening on the other side of that connection. They're simply, the producers are simply posting those messages to the Kafka broker, and then the, the, uh, the, the other side is consuming them. By the way, this could be going either way. I could e just as easily switch these topics or switch these, these headings and say that the IBMI is the producer of the message, sending them to Kafka, and all of these other devices are consuming the message. It can go both ways. So if you look at the pub sub architecture with Kafka, I've got the the e the e-commerce system in this in this example that's publishing uh, order inquiries. So the order inquiries are going into this order inquiry topic. The consumers are subscribing to that order inquiry topic, so they get the information every time that that a message gets posted to that to that topic. So so those are events that are hitting the 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 Kafka server, and the 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 topic here is a is an ordered list. And every every whoop, every new message that comes in is added to the end of that list. So let's talk a little bit more about those topics. So topics again are streams of related messages. They're, it's a logical representation. So basically, it's a way of categorizing messages that they're they are particular kind of message. But it 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 is a conceptual idea. It's not a physical thing. It's a conceptual idea that says these messages are related. There's another concept called a partition, which is actually the physical location where the topic is stored. And you can have multiple copies of a topic. But I, and I'll talk about that in a second. But the 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 topic is really just the concept that this is a set of related messages. And you can have an, a, a many to many relationship between producers and topics. You can have many producers who are uh, posting messages to many, many different topics. And you can have as many topics as you want. And these might be some examples of Kafka topics and, and messages. So I've got you know, blood pressure readings. It's got the patient identifier, the date and time of the reading, and what the reading was. So I've got that information coming in. And again, it's an immutable list, right? So it's a, it's a list you don't change. It's like a log. And the latest messages are going to the bottom of the log. So, so here we've got you know, truck arrivals and departures. And again, just a whole bunch of uh, messages that are getting posted in, in the arrival sequence. Now, what Kafka does for you also is that it replicates those brokers. So if I've got a Kafka broker and it's got a series of topics, so I've got all these different topics on my Kafka broker, I can set it up so that it will replicate itself. And it does all the infrastructure for doing this so that I can ensure that if one of these brokers go down, goes down, I'm not down. The other brokers are still up and running. And so, so it's really for two purposes. One is so you can handle the very, very high performance. You, know, you can handle tons and tons of messages that are coming in because you can have as many of these brokers as you want. So you can have lots and lots and lots of them. And it's resilient in that if some of the brokers go down, 
you have other ones that are still up and running. Same thing if you want to do upgrades, you can upgrade your, your, your applications without bringing the, the Kafka brokers down. They can still continue to run. So you can continue to post messages and consume messages on the, the Kafka brokers that are up and running. So it's designed to be very, very high performance and very, very high speed. So that's how you know uh, companies like LinkedIn get 7 trillion messages a day. It's because they've got literally thousands of these Kafka brokers out there that are handling the, those incoming messages. And as a subscriber, I can subscribe to multiple topics. And again, this is based on authentication and authorization as to what I'm allowed to see. But if I am allowed to, I can choose which topics I subscribe to and I can get the messages from those topics. So different subscribers can have different combinations of topics that they're subscribing to and getting messages from. And again, the producer, from the perspective of what it's publishing, does not care. So there's no sort of any custom logic you have to build in there. In the Kafka cluster, you are identifying what people are authorized to see, what they can get. But I don't really care about who's subscribing it from, from the code that I have to write in order to make this communication work. I'm simply posting the messages and the consumers are consuming the messages and Kafka's taking care of who gets what. And then there's a management system around this to manage all this for you. So you don't have to manage all of the, the replication. You don't have to manage where the message is coming from. You know, how do I make sure that I'm getting only one copy of the message and not multiple copies of the message? And that's using the the what, what's been current is the is Zookeeper. So you'll hear about Zookeeper. It's a it's a management system for Kafka, but that is being replaced by a thing called Kafka Raft. And we don't really have time to go into a whole lot of detail about that, but this is the, the new management management system that's replacing uh, Zookeeper. But the key here is that Kafka is providing the management functions inside of it. So you don't have to build that yourself. It's managing this whole sort of process of, of, of bringing in these, these messages from these streams and managing the replication. It's handling all of that for you. So some real world Kafka use cases, people are actually using this technology. Uh, this is you know, one, one of the first ones we ran into was a, a customer of ours that uh, they were a trucking company and they had been uh, dealing with about a hundred requests a day. And then they signed up to partner with, uh, with Amazon and a couple other online providers. And suddenly their rate requests uh, into some, I guess, 3PL companies and their rate requests went up to a million requests a day. And so suddenly they had this massive number of requests coming in that they wanted to be able to deal with. And they had to be able to re respond really, really quickly if they didn't provide very, very fast response they didn't get the opportunity to play in those those particular transactions. We work, we're working with a fin financial services company that's tracking uh, payment data, so information coming in from, from the people they're, they're loaning to, and they're, they're getting 12,000 transactions a second, so a very, very high volume of, of transactions coming in from the payment systems. We had a, a, a distributor that they had to process an FTP file, and they thought, well, it's one file. How long could it take until they found out that they were getting over a million transactions in that FTP file. And the way they were processing it was taking them actually a couple of days. And so by moving it into, a, into Kafka, they can, they can process those transactions much, much faster. We had another customer, they were a retail chain. And on Black Friday, they said that their, their, their uh, traffic went from a few thousand transactions a, sec a second to over 80,000 transactions a second. So they had to be able to rapidly scale up. So the, the Kafka replication thing was a, a powerful option for them to be able to very quickly scale up and then scale back down when they didn't need that kind of power anymore. Uh, again, e a key e-commerce customer we had who had 80 different warehouses and the, each warehouse actually was running different warehouse management systems because they had been uh, they had been acquired. And so uh, they needed to be able to talk to all of those warehouses simultaneously and yet provide very, very fast response. So again, they use that sort of publish subscribe way of doing things in order to talk to all those different systems. We have worked with an insurance company that they were getting uh, requests for insurance quotes. From, uh, from some of their business partners and they wanted to be able to respond to those with sub second response time. So they were able to take uh, the sudden increase in, in requests for quotes through this kind of, of, of architecture. And then we were working with a healthcare company that does real-time patient monitoring. They told us that with some of the devices they had out in the field that 
they were liable if, if the device actually identified a problem with the patient and they didn't respond, they were actually liable because they were monitoring it. So they needed to know immediately if some kind of a problem was, was discovered, they had to be notified right away. So just some examples, again, we could go on and on and on with real world examples in the IBMI world of people who, who are using this kind of technology. This is just a sample of one where it's an e-commerce store where you can order things through the e-commerce site. So when a, when a user goes in and does an inquiry and, and, and asks for a price on a, a basket of goods, the thing, it posts to the Kafka cl cluster, the Kafka cluster checks the inventory, it, it gets, so it posts that message, the inventory system actually then uh, updates the information about what it has available. The pricing algorithm sends back a price for it. The, the credit system actually figures out, do they have the credit to buy this thing? And they check with the, the, the shipping partner identifies when they'll be able to deliver that. So they're all subscribing to that, that, Kafka, uh, that Kafka cluster in order to get those messages. And then we have customers who are using using this for high speed text messaging, both inbound and outbound. So they can they can send text messages out to customers or partners as things are happening, or they can process incoming text messages. This was an interesting use case. This was a customer that actually needed to integrate form data. They had all these government forms, and they needed to take IBMI data, generate the documents, and then distribute those documents to thousands and thousands of potential end, end consumers. And so they, they posted the documents to Kafka. So again, with Kafka, you can include binary files. You can include these large files in the messages or pointers to those files in the messages. So they, they were able to, to provide that kind of instantaneous response and distribute those, those documents out. And then this is a, a real common one where, where we have customers who are doing real-time vehicle tracking. I know Aaron, you were just working with a customer on on something like this, right? Where they they were they were had been doing polling, but it wasn't fast enough. Right, right. Well it was actually a very interesting conversation because the way the system is set up um, is it's looking for updates on a particular file by reading the file and scanning it for changes um, on a on a five minute interval actually was was the interval that they were specifically looking at. Um, and what happened is basically the the, the business um, came down and said that five minutes is not it's not fast enough. I mean, even scanning this table every or this file every five minutes is not enough. We need it to be immediate that we get these notifications because we have requirements to uh, to deal with incidents very very quickly. Um, and that's that's really a where you need to get into this kind of event driven architecture because. You know, batch processes generally are are, are not going to get you those kinds of real time responses. Great, and so so here just to, so, so, some real world stuff here. This is here's some sample code for for talking to Kafka in JavaScript. Uh, so you, if you, and you don't need to know what the, the JavaScript to to go through this, but basically it says this first line tells you to use the the JavaScript module, which is great. So all of the code for Talking to Kafka is actually already built for you. You can use the JavaScript module to do that. It's free code and you can just use it. Here it's identifying the broker. So where is that broker that I need to produce to? Here it's creating the producer and, and connecting to Kafka. And then here is the thing to actually send, send the message, to actually send that Kafka message. So it's not complicated code to do this. Once you, once you want to do this, you decide you want to do this, it's not complicated code to actually send out the stuff to a, to the Kafka broker. This, these are just some sample real Kafka messages that that they send send out you know, from different you know something coming from a sensor, something coming from data entry, you know something coming from somebody's device. Lots and lots of different things for sending out messages, but this is what a Kafka message might look like. And so then, just to wrap this up before Aaron sort of shows you some stuff. You need to be able to tie this to the IBMI, and there are some specific things you need to do for the IBMI because the IBMI isn't really built to out of the box work with with things like Kafka. So there are things you need to do. So how do I produce messages for Kafka from RPG or Kafka? Actually, Aaron, do you want to go through this? Yeah, um, sure. Actually, you know what? Just to make this easier for me to uh, to show it, why don't uh, I share my screen and then I can 
control the slides here. Give me one yeah, second. And, yeah, in fact, you can just slide. go on to your, your demo right after it, too. Absolutely. Okay. One second here. Oh, you're going to have to end your screen share for me to share. Okay, great. All right. Does anybody, uh, do you see my screen, Dan? Yes. Awesome. Okay, great. Yeah, let's let's jump in. Right, so we've talked about Kafka, and we've talked about what it does, why it does it, and kind of how it does it, some of those core um, concepts. The next logical question, at least I think, is how do we actually do this? Great, we know we want to do it. How do we actually get there? So let's talk about how we connect that to the IBMI. In order to work with Kafka, the most fundamental thing that you have to be able to do is you have to be able to connect to the broker, you have to be able to send messages, and you have to be able to receive messages, right? So we have to be able to produce our messages um, from our RPG applications, or for those of you out there who are um, COBOL shops or whatever else you're using, right? We have to be able to produce messages. We have to be able to format our messages properly from our database and get them ready to be sent. Um, we have to be able to do the opposite side, which is consuming messages that are coming back in from Kafka. We have to be able to translate those. We have to handle an event-driven architecture. You know, one of the one of the toughest things here is actually getting your application into that event-driven way of functioning. You know, it's instead of I'm going to scan a file and look for changes, it's I'm going to tell the broker, let me know when something happens. And when that happens, I'm going to react to that thing that's happening. So it's a, it's a, it's a different way of thinking about our, uh, about our software. Um, and of course, we have to make sure things are secure. What it all comes down to um, is you're, it's going to be very difficult to try to implement your own Kafka client. The way that you work with Kafka is it's fully open source. What you do is you download a Kafka client, which is a system that allows you to send and receive messages and manage all of the capabilities around Kafka and everything you need to do. Um, so we want to be able to we want to use those clients so that we don't have to rewrite all of this logic um, from scratch. And and luckily, a lot of languages have um, Kafka clients, right? These clients are very very complicated. I really want to stress that. So. Um, I, you know, I, I would strongly recommend looking for these clients. Um, unfortunately, though, we run into a little bit of a problem here, which is that there, there is no major Kafka client for uh, direct calling from RPG or from COBOL. It's, you know, Java, JavaScript, Python, those languages. So the core philosophy here that we want to look at is, can we get our RPG talking to our open source programs over a high-speed link and then we can use the open source Kafka clients. Um, and that's exactly what we do. And I want to just take a moment to point out here, we stole this slide from Steve Will. Um, and basically, that strategy is the broader strategy of the IBM I. So we just want to make sure to mention here that the broader strategy of the IBM I development is to start supporting these blended applications where we're taking the best of the open source world and binding it into our RPG and our COBOL applications. And that is exactly what I'm recommending here. Kafka is a great example. My RPG talks to open source, and the open source can use the Kafka client. Um, all we need is that really high-speed link um, in between the two sides. And that's basically coming from one central philosophy, which is that each tool in our toolbox, our RPG, our JavaScript, our Python, our COBOL, all that stuff is designed to do specific things. And if we're using tools that are designed to do what we're doing, we're going to get a much better application than if we try to hack a tool to do something that it wasn't built to do. Um, just a quick comment here. Uh, in event-driven architectures, JavaScript programming language was designed for event-driven um, software. So it's very, very good at it. Um, so I strongly recommend taking a look at that if you want to get into event-driven architectures. Basically, as opposed to our RPG code, which is very top-down, we have a start and a finish of our program. Um, a JavaScript application is designed around events. It's designed around saying, when this happens, do this. On this event, handle it this way. Right? It's much more designed in that kind of flow, and that makes it very appropriate 
um, for this sort of high speed event driven um, asynchronous applications. Dan, did you want to um, did you want to go through this slide? Just yes, real actually, I want you to get into the demo, but just real quickly, sure, that's really what we we've done with inside of Aridani Connect. So 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 uh, one of the things we've done is try to simplify that connection to the IBMI and do all that work of how does the IBMI talk to to Kafka and build that into this Aridani Connect layer, so you don't have to do that. Right, right, because the critical piece is. I've got this great Kafka client in my JavaScript and I've got my business application in my RPG. What I need is a link between them so that I can actually ship data between them over that high performance link so that I can then take advantage of the two sides in a real production. Um, in yeah, and, and the important thing here is, it, is this layer has to be very, very high speed. And, and yes, Steve, it does support COBOL. Yes, it has to be very, very high speed because otherwise you lose all the, the advantage of, of Kafka. Right. right? You, right. you have system, to be able to keep up with the thousands of messages a second that might be coming through that. Right. Especially in a streaming infrastructure, your system is only as fast as its slowest um, component in the, in the stream. Yeah. Right, and just as an example of that, um, we were just doing a, a, a Kafka implementation recently, um, and basically what we were looking at there is trying to get our target performance was to get 8,000 messages per second through the Kafka link, um, and, and that's basically, this is how we did it, right? What we did is said, our RPG is going to fire off messages through this high-performance link to the open source side. That side is going to publish the messages. Um, just a quick um, other note about that, we want to delegate as much as we can to the right tool for the job. So it, another example of something that we do in here is we're, we're publishing JSON messages. We're sending those directly to the open source. We're not processing JSON in our RPG. Um, you know, there's a lot of little things that go into that decision, but essentially when we're trying to get this high performance, the JSON parser in Node.js um, according in our benchmarks runs about 20,000 times faster than doing a JSON table operation in RPG. In a lot of applications, that's not going to make or break the system. But when we're talking about these 8,000 calls per second, we have to make sure that every piece is as fast as possible. And that's why we really strongly recommend using um, tools that are designed for our jobs. So with that, um, I'm going to jump in. Um, and I have a little Kafka application here that I want to show you guys. Um, so I'm going to go through that real quick because I think uh, Dan, correct me. I think we have three minutes. Yeah, yeah you got you, you, you take five. <laughs> okay, great. So what I'm looking at here, um, this is a great system that I want everyone to to take a note of if you're interested in using Kafka, and that is a system called Confluent. Um, Confluent is cloud hosted Kafka. So instead of you having to set up your own servers and get the Kafka broker and configure it and run it and make sure it's reliable and get Zookeeper and blah, 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 you know all the stuff that you need to do to run a production cluster, you sign up for an account, create your Kafka cluster, done. They run it, they manage it, they ensure 100% uptime, don't have to worry about any of those problems. So this is what I'm using um, in, this particular, uh, in this particular example. Now, Dan mentioned earlier, messages in Kafka are put onto a topic. I have a topic here. It is called test topic. So my RPG program here is going to send messages to the test topic, and that is going to um, show up in here where I'm watching my dashboard. I'm just going to refresh it to make sure it's still got a good link. Um, now, I'm going to flip over to my, uh, to my 5250 here. Let me actually get that onto the screen that you can see. And what I want to do here, first of all, I just want to make sure that this guy is still happy and running. Great. He's still there. Okay. What I'm going to do is I have an RPG program here. Call it post-transaction, right? This is to send some data related to a financial transaction specifically over to my Kafka client. Now, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to tell this program, I want you to send one message um, and basically, my message is going to say the account ID that got a payment was account number one, and the amount that was paid was $1 on this account. So I'm notifying of payments. Essentially, my use case here is I have users who are coming in and posting payments on accounts, and I need to be notified every time that happens so that I can process it, 
um, and make sure that it goes through successfully. And of course, notify someone if their payment is declined. So I'm going to send one message, account ID one, amount paid is one. And you can see here, I'm going to the topic, test topic. Now, what I'm going to do is uh, send that over. And what I should see here, um, if I get my play button, is on this topic in my Kafka cluster, I see my message here. It says ID one, amount paid is one. So my message came through. I got that message um, on this topic. And I'm just watching this. So in this view here, if I had any consumer applications that were waiting, that were reading those messages, they'd also be receiving those um, alongside here. Now, I'm going to do something a little bit more interesting. Uh, personally, I think it is at least. Um, let's see, I'm going to do that one. I want uh, this guy. Um, and I'm going to come back here and I'm going to have it send, I'm going to do 1900 messages. Why not? So I'm going to send those out and hang out here on my cluster here. It might take my browser a little bit to catch up. Um, but over here, I now have this whole list here um, of all my messages that I sent. Um, and I actually have a system here that's um, giving me metrics um, for this particular uh, for this particular call. That was actually a little slower than it usually is. But that was about, what is that? That's looking at somewhere around 1,000 or 1,200 calls per second. And just to give everyone a little bit of uh, a little bit of context here, the uh, machine that I'm running this on, um, I believe, is 0.4 cores. I think I have four tenths of a core on this machine and eight gigabytes of RAM. So I'm running this on a little baby IBM I um, uh, that I have in my cloud partition. Um, yeah, actually, that one went a lot faster. So I just ran that again, and that time it was about it was less than half a millisecond per message. So this is running a little over two thousand calls per second. Um, through this little baby LPAR. Um, so that's that's the critical piece here, right? Is I've got this extremely fast output or this extremely high throughput on this connector. We're talking thousands of messages per second um, on this IBM I with it never really breaking a sweat, even on this um, on this small IBM I. Now, just to jump in a little bit um, to the actual application here, I have in my VS code here, the actual code for this program. Um, just a really quick thing here. Basically, what my program does, I told it I want 1,900 messages. What it's doing, it's going to loop. And for each message, I just want everyone to notice what I'm doing here is filling in the messages in a data structure. I am adding fields to a data structure or filling in data in a data structure. Um, running it through, this is a generated conversion system that's added um, automatically by um, by an Aerodani code generator. And then what I do here is I do this send request. I call a program, which is going to fire off that message. Now that's critical. I am getting this out of my RPG program as quickly as possible. And I'm just working with a data queue or with a, sorry, with a data structure. So the critical piece here is that I fill in the information in my data structure and then I fire it off as quickly as possible. I'm not doing JSON parsing in here. I am not trying to call APIs for my RPG. I am giving this over to a system that is designed to do this kind of integration. Um, and on the flip side, just like what Dan showed earlier, I've got some JavaScript on the other side that's doing this producer.send that I've got highlighted here, which is where it actually uses that open source Kafka client to feed in a topic and some messages and ship them off um, to that Kafka broker. And that is how the system is able to do it, it's, is, is able to get this throughput. It's getting a very high speed link between the RPG and the JavaScript, and then letting the two systems do exactly what they are um, intended to do. I just saw a couple of quick questions, so I just wanted to uh, make sure to answer um, at least this one, which is that um, I saw someone ask that, uh, asked if this system works with Kafka or any other open source event driver uh, or event messaging software. The critical piece that I want to point out about this whole architecture, um, this, this open source fusion, whether Aerodani based or not, is that once you've got your RPG or your COBOL fused with your open source code, you can take advantage of whatever's out there. So the answer is yes, there are drivers for Azure event hubs, um, for MQTT, and for, uh, for Google PubSub, for Amazon SNS, for basically any system that you need to use. You've got these in the open source community. There's about 2.3 million 
open source modules available for JavaScript. They all do different things. Um, and I can, you can bring those into your applications. Once you've got that high speed link between RPG and JavaScript, you can take advantage of those from the RPG. And that is really the key of this whole architecture. It's what makes this work is that that high speed link that actually allows the two systems to, um, to talk to each other. Hey, right, hey so Paul, I know we're, we're, we're running over, but uh, should we hold the other questions till the end? Uh, yeah, if, if yep. you can, because you might actually yep. be able to take care of them just in the chat, a couple of them. Uh, yep. and okay. Otherwise, don't worry, we'll have a few minutes at the end to touch anything that you guys didn't get to. Great. All right. Well, great. Well, thanks, Aaron. And, and, and thanks, everybody. And I will turn it back to Paul. Cool. Thanks, guys. That was great. Yet another speed of light presentation that somehow still made perfect sense. So, so well done, guys. Well done. Oh, let me just start sharing again here. And... Okay. So uh, in this bit, I'd like to just sort of delve a little bit more into actually creating indexes and more touching on the type of indexes that are not advised by the index advisor, but will actually be used if they're there. Okay? So this would be sort of the role that's played by a database engineer, uh, because of course we don't have DBAs, we don't have um, database architects on IBMI because most of what they do is actually done by our ops admin people. So for this bit, what I've done here is create a sort of a little sample table uh, to, to play with. And, um, you know, it's called for index. And as you can see, really meaningful things here like key ID, some text, some code, some value, other one, other two, other three uh, type of thing. Just main thing here is that I have created a primary key on it here, which is on the key ID. So remember that will result in an access path being created based on the primary key for this table. Now I then populated this table with a million rows. Okay, so I wrote a little uh, stored procedure to do this. Um, but and the only columns I'm using in the examples here are the uh, first four the key ID, some text, some code, some value. Um, and just so you know, uh, in some text, uh, the text, all of the text begins with the, one of these words, low, hit, medium, or high. And the important thing for one of our examples later is that only a hundred of the million rows begin with the word hit, okay? And then the other one is the code. The code is one where we have a uh, low cardinality. So in other words, there are only four values in that column across all million rows, which will be one of those four values there. Now, if anybody wants to play with this on any stage, by the way, um, uh, if you uh, look in the handout, uh, the code for the stored procedure to populate the table and all of that is there. So feel free to you know go and play with something this or make changes to it so you can get better ideas of how to play with it yourselves if you wish. Okay, the first place we're gonna start with this, by the way, is with um, uh, Visual Explain, okay? And because this is where you can see uh, the effect of having uh, an index. So to get to Visual Explain, the easiest place is from within um, Run SQL scripts. So if we take line 48 there, that select statement, if I put the cursor anywhere on that statement, and then select the explain option up here and not run an explainer that just pick the explain one and the explain is basically uh, saying um, tell me what it is you would do yeah if you went to run this statement and give me an idea of how long it would take so for this example here now remember at this stage the only thing I have on the table is that primary uh, key constraint okay so for the sequence here that I'm looking at, some value in descending sequence, there is no index out there. There are no indexes built yet on this table. So what Visual Explain tells me is that it's going to do a table scan. In other words, it's going to read all 100 million, all 1 million rows into memory. And then it's going to do a temporary sorted list 
and from that sorted list it will do a scan which will be giving me everything and then I'm going to get my results set. Okay. Now, in here, in Visual Explain, once I've done that explain, it will advise indexes to me. So if I go up here to Actions, and there under Actions, I've got the option Index and Statistics Advisor. And in here, it's telling me, yes, this is, I recommend you build an index, which is just keyed on some value. Okay. Now, if I hit the Create button there, it would bring up the wizard for creating an index that's indeed in, um, in uh, ACS. Or if I show, do show SQL, it would show me the SQL that I need. Yeah, change the name of the index as you require. <coughs> okay, so let's look at the important bits in this. So this was my select statement. And when I looked at this in, in uh, as we saw there in uh, Visual Explain, it was telling me that it estimates that this would take 530 uh, milliseconds uh, to run. Okay. The advise indexed that it had, if I create that index, okay, and then if I do visual explain on the statement again, it now looks something like this. So I'm going to say, so I've created the index, and now it starts doing an index scan for the rows, and from that does a table probe to actually get the rows I want does a little bit of logic in there and gives me the final select. The important thing is that the estimate has now gone from 530 milliseconds to 1.7 milliseconds. So in other words, the index means that this is going to be 500, and 500 times odd faster or 450 times faster, whichever, okay? So that's great that, you know, this is the point of having an index. But the thing is, I can actually make this faster, okay? And this is an index that was not advised to me. So this is where we are. This was the bottom of the last one, okay? We're doing absolutely fine. But here I'm now going to create a new index, and this index is going to be keyed on the value, right, in descending sequence and the key ID. Now, if you look at what I'm doing in here, is that since this select statement was only selecting two columns, and, and by the way, I'm going to do this. If it was three or four, it'd be fine as well. But I'm putting all of those into the key of the index, which means now, if I look at the advice on that select statement, it's picking everything up from the index scan. Okay, so if you look at what it's done here, the comparison, it's dropped those two middle bits of having to do a table probe to retrieve the actual rows and then do the logic that picks out the columns that I need from those rows okay so here okay now not as big as we saw before but we've jumped from 1.7 down to 0.4 okay so this is now four times faster so just so you get the idea here of this is what index strategy is really about is we've gone from an original thing with no indexes of 530 milliseconds to less than half a millisecond okay so that's example one so here's another one where, um, and quite a common one, this, uh, where I'm selecting everything. I'm going to select all columns. Um, but look at my criteria here, where the lower of some text is like hit. Now, if you remember, I said earlier, I only have 100 rows in there that satisfy this. Okay. Um, so when we look at this, it's going to say it's going to take about 83 millis 84 milliseconds to do this. And the table scan means it's reading every row. And if you think about it, that's what it has to do, because it has to say, well, I've got to take a row. I've got to take the text, that, that uh, sum text, convert it to lowercase, and see if it begins with hit. No, it doesn't. Okay. So this process, it's basically going to process um, 900,900 uh, 900, uh, rows, um, 900,900, 900, you know, less a hundred, million less a hundred. <laughs> rows okay just to come up with the hundred that i want the important thing when i did this in visual explain it didn't advise it didn't recommend an index so derived key indexes are not advised okay it, it, what i mean by that is not is that the the optimizer does not advise it even though it would be a good thing right and it would use it so if i go ahead and create this index okay so i'm creating it here and the index is the lower of some text. 
Okay. And now if we look at what, what we have, okay, it's now doing an index probe, and that index probe is saying, yeah, here are the hundred rows that you need. So it then goes and gets those hundred rows and puts them in my result set. And the timing on this has jumped down to 1.2. Okay, so from 83 milliseconds to just over one millisecond. Okay, so this is a derived key index. Now remember, it is one that is not automatically advised, but will be of benefit to you. Um, a sparse index, again, usually comes in from where clauses. So again, I'm selecting some columns here, and I have some where some value is less than 10,000. Okay, and again, 86 milliseconds being the, uh, the recommended uh, size. It did actually, in this case, uh, advise two indexes. Uh, one based on some value, okay? And the sum value is so it can do this bit, okay? Remember for the where clause. And the second one then is for the sequence right, uh, that it wants to use. And if we looked at that, we can see much more complicated, and I'm not going through what all of these bits are. Um, but by just creating those uh, indexes, okay, I've now gone from 86 milliseconds down to 6 milliseconds. Okay? Again, a vast improvement with the recommended indexes. But let's look at this um, and sort of say, well, could I have made it better? And I said, yeah, well, if I created a sparse index, I could. So if I had, so if I get rid of my two index, index 4 and 5, okay, and in here I'm creating a new one with that key, where the value is less than 10,000. Okay, so where the logic that I'm using is within the index, or there was on the where clause. And now we're going straight from an index scan on that sparse index, okay, and then retrieving the rows and that what goes in, into it. So we're down now to 1.2 milliseconds from our original 86. Okay, now one of the cool things then is with EVIs encoded vector indexes and again uh, this is something um, that we have to watch out with with advices and that um, so uh, we select these okay uh, group by some code now, so if you look at here i'm doing a grouping so i'm grouping by some code now remember some code has low cardinality their own it's going to end up with four rows in the result set here and for every row you know for the values a a b b c c d d i will have how many of them are there and then what the sum of the value is, okay? So when we look at this, again, it's going from a table scan, et cetera, and that great big enormous 394 milliseconds to process a million rows. Now, in this case, it advises an index. It says you should create this index. So I create the index, and I say, you know, show me the index advice again. And lo and behold, the index advice is the exact same. And it says, yeah, you've got 394 milliseconds. The index actually appears to have made no difference. Okay. Now, the reason for this is to understand why did it advise that index? It didn't advise the index so that I could be, so it would make the retrieval faster. Okay. It advised the index so it could figure out different ways of approaching how to get the rows quickly. So what it created here, or what it recommended I create, was this index, which was there for statistical information. So if I was to look this at this in the index advisor, this is what the difference is between these two columns here of the last query use and the last query statistics use. So it created this just for doing statistical analysis. And really what it was looking at here was cardinality information. Okay. So how would I use an EVI to make this faster, right? Because I know that I can make it faster. So I'm going to create an encoded vector index. So this is, you know, instead of saying create index, it's create encoded vector index. This is what makes it an EVI. And I'm going to create it based on the code. But here comes the cool bit. I'm going to say I want to include the count and the sum. And what that means is that within the index, what, the, what is going to happen is that the count and the sum will be maintained in the index itself every time I insert or update or delete a row. So it's constantly maintaining that count 
and sum. So when I now run that statement, instead of having to go out and to all of the rows and you know get the sequence right and then go to every row and count how many there are and then add together all of the values, it's just going to grab that information uh, directly from what's in the index. So this is what we'd see. It says it goes to this EVI symbol table scan, uses some logic to give me the final result set. So we're now down to 0.426, less than half a millisecond from something that was 394 milliseconds. And here's the cool thing, by the way. If I now add in another million rows okay, to this, right, but still with just those four values, for now 2 million rows, the runtime will be 0.426. For 5 million rows, as long as there are only four values, it'll still be 0.426. Okay, a few last bits just to watch out for a general thing uh, when it comes to um, indexes and this that we have, uh, we uh, sort of recommend advising things like numeric conversions in where clauses or order by clauses, uh, arithmetic expressions, character string padding, are the use of like where you begin with a percent or an underscore. Okay, there are things that really you cannot allow, you know, that indexing can't allow for. Um, so, you know, avoid them if you can, you, you will sort of take a, a, a hit on it. Here are some references, okay, uh, for you if you want to read up more on indexing and on indexing strategies and a little bit on the db 2 for i services that are available out there as well. Okay, so uh, let me see a couple of questions. Uh, where can we find documentation about the different visual explain icons and the interactions uh, amongst them? Um, the indexing strategy guide that I mentioned there has some of them in there, but if you want to get an in-depth one, the only place I really know of doing that is there is a course run by lab services and in there they cover all of it. I have yet to come across a sort of a detailed uh, description of everything that is in Visual Explain. Um, and part of the reason for that is, is that it does change quite rapidly with every, you know, there's always new stuff that comes into play in there on um, every uh, TR uh, on the system. Um, is there any way we can find out if any indexes are not being used? I mean, clearly the they're not being used and keep only that are frequently used. So, uh, so uh, sorry, and I'm Anton, I'm sure you have answered that in there. Yep, yes, you have indeed. Okay, is it possible driving us over mapped subfields in an XML dot? No, uh, it's not. Um, uh, nope, afraid not. Um, Okay, uh, if the EVI uses a scalar function, will the performance be the same? Okay, so tell me, it, that depends on where you mean the performance. Do you mean the performance on, like if you're using a select statement or that? Uh, with a select statement, the scalar function would make it quicker. Um, uh, oh, okay, Kevin, that may be my fault. Uh, sorry, folks, uh, Kevin just says that he doesn't see the fill index procedure in the PDF. That may be my fault. It was a hidden one. I will check that. Okay, so if you give me about an hour uh, after we uh, finish here and check again um, uh, and just hit the download again, um, it'll be, it will be there. Okay. Um, so uh, Charles says EVI automatically includes count. Though I seem to recall a PTF to fix where the EVI wasn't being used to return the count. Okay, not quite sure what that means, uh, Charles. Sorry about that. Ah, John has replied to it. Okay. EVI example. Couldn't that be a performance issue of a large table having many inserts and updates? Uh, sorry. So, okay, you, you, Deborah, you raise a good point here about performance on this thing of maintenance of indexes. Okay. The, I promise you that if you have one index on a table or 50 indexes on a table, you will find it impossible to see the difference when you insert, update, and delete rows in terms of performance on the system. Technically, is it a performance hit? 
Technically, yes. Can you spot the difference? Probably not. The only place that you will ever see performance hits is when you are doing mass changes to a table. And by that, I mean, if you do something like a purge, where like at an end of day process, you did something like delete 80% of the rows in the table, then you can see a performance hit um, on, on the maintenance of indexes. Um, and again, how big a performance hit depends on how many disks you have physically on your system. It's a, it becomes more a, a, a hardware issue. And sometimes the solution to that is, a, it, so the only time you really will see these hits is in a batch type environment. And if you are uh, sort of seeing that, sort of the recommendation sometime is, okay, well, what you do is you delete the index, run the batch process, recreate the index, okay? Uh, would be the solution. Um, okay, so hopefully, Kevin, um, the performance reference that, I, that I, I, I've taken care of that, uh, these are not big deals, okay? Um, okay. Oh, sorry. Yes, Charles, you are correct. The count was unneeded in your creation coded vector index. Um, but having said that, if I was creating an encoded vector index specifically for the use of, of count, it, even though it's not needed, I would consider good documentation to put it in there because it means when somebody looks at it, they sort of go, oh, I think that was this was being created. So we could use it specifically with count was part of the reason for creating it, as opposed to a just performance gain that, that I would expect with the EVI. Okay. Okay, so by the way, uh, yeah, um, just to come back on Nanda's uh, uh, question there, uh, Anton has sort of um, an answered in the automatic index advice processor, uh, but you can, if you want yourself, look in the uh, sys indexes in there at the statistical information that's in there. So, um, you know, and whatever the criteria is that you want as to whether or not you should keep them. But the, the key thing, and this is why I put it in the presentation, to look at the last query use and at the last stati statistic use as well. So it can be a thing that you know that you can say, yeah, you know, you know, this index hasn't been used to retrieve information ever, but it's constantly being used by the optimizer to do statistical checks on things, um, uh, um, you know, like number of values for columns, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. Um, I should have said negative, which is an average in EVI. Uh, so yeah, no. Uh, sorry, Tommy. It, the maintenance of those, I mean, you're you're not going to see see the difference uh, by specifying it in there. Is there anywhere that backs the statement about performance for adding index? My manager frown on indexes for performance reasons. Okay, well then, all I would say is that um, your managers don't know what they're talking about, uh, Rob. Um, the index strategy guide, by the way, that's in there, uh, gives a lot of good information about this about performance where this thing about you know lots of indexes having an overhead it comes from some of the system 38 and from the as 400 in 1989 okay any of these sort of problems disappeared with at the latest sort of 1994 in in terms of the stuff with with you know the number of indexes there's a weird thing that people have in their head that you shouldn't have more than 32 indexes built on a table Okay, um, I think that came from people thinking, you know, from the thing of you can't have more than 32 formats and logical, <laughs> you know, so um, I've no idea. Okay. Um, okay. Tables with 2.4 billion rows are still a performance issue. Um, but sorry, yes, they are. Okay, but they're going to be an issue with any. I mean, if you've got a lot, very large tables, um, you know, the, your best way of maybe hitting those is looking at things like derived key indexes. Um, so if you can sort of hone them down, um, so within indexes, you are actually putting them into sort of areas where things can be selected very, very quickly by the optimizer, it will use them. Okay. So um, yes, they, you know, they, they can still have a performance issue. 
um, whether there are a million rows or 2.4 billion rows in a table in terms of the maintenance of indexes, that makes no difference. Okay, it's in the actual data retrieval, you know, and and that. So actually, the bigger that your um, that your uh, tables are in terms of number of rows, the more important it is to have all of the right indexes in place, uh, so you can have the quickest uh, retrieval possible. Okay, so Richard, sorry, yes. Uh, in answer to your question, the index benefit and I available to Python when called from IBM I. Okay, so if remember what I if you were there when I said at the start about the optimizer, any SQL request goes to the one place to the one optimizer. So it doesn't care whether it's a Python making the request or Java or anything else. Okay. So a, a single record SQL now on par or faster than um, record level access. Uh, so Larry, um, th the answer to that is it depends. Okay, it can be. Yeah, um, but still, and again, by the way, to measure the difference between these, it is, you, you know, you're, you're talking fractions of a millisecond uh, in terms of the difference. Um, Really, the benefit of in, in embedded SQL is that if you compare something on, like on this table, for example, a multi row fetch of a million rows compared to an RPG read loop over over the index, um, the it, it, the multi row fetch is uh, five times faster. OK, and that's what's really with multiples. Uh, would you talk about the hierarchy of creating an index when determining if the where or order by is more important? Um, so, Lita, it, it's 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 not a thing. It, the, the the it will look at multiples. The optimizer will look at all indexes and decide which one is best. Okay. So, um, but what it looks at first, by the way, is that the optimizer. The first thing it looks at in a statement is the where clause. Okay. The last thing it looks like at a, is the order by. Okay. Okay. So you just remember creating an SQL view does not automatically create a view, correct? And you cannot create an index over a view, correct? Well, okay. You cannot create an index over a view. Okay. What a view is is just an SQL select statement. So when you create the view, that statement is stored as an object. So when you say select from the view. What the optimizer does is it takes the select statement that's in the view and your select statement and it merges them together into one select statement, which is the statement that gets run. OK, so um, which, by the way, is the statement that you would have had to write if the view wasn't there. Okay? So, so, so that's kind of what it is. And sorry, yes. So, they, so creating a view does not create an index. The one thing that you cannot have when you create a view is an order by. No order by means no index, means no access path. Okay? Means no access path, so no index. Um, so uh, tips for partition tables, sort of outside the scope of what I'm talking here, air one really, and um, sort of since I'm running over here by a good 10 minutes. Uh, okay. How about join fields? Should the join fields be higher than the select fields? Uh, I, I, again, it, it sort of makes no difference on that one, Lida. Um, so the, the complicated SQL, by the way, what I would be doing is looking at an individual explain, looking at what indexes are advised, create those indexes, and then see. Okay, um, that, that is sort of the best, that is always your best approach. Usually what you will find, by the way, is about 80% of any of your issues will be taken care of by advised indexes. It's the, it's the last bits where you look at things for, in the examples of what I was doing there. So things, for example, oh, well, in the where clause, they're using something like the lower of. So, you know, a drive key index would be of benefit there. Okay, what part does the access plan play? So Ramon, I gather you're speaking here about the access plan that is stored in the RPG program itself um, when you're using embedded SQL. Um, okay, uh, 
the part that's played for it, you would need to know an awful lot about what's going on in the SQL optimizer. But the original purpose that that it had, which was that it, it made static SQL faster, that is no longer true. So if you have a dynamic statement or a static statement in embedded SQL and RPG, the only speed difference between the two is the length of time it takes you to you know, concatenate your SQL statement together and to do the prepare, which is going to be about half a millisecond. So, and then the actual performance will be the exact same. Okay. Um, there are a couple of little things in there uh, that are, are, are where it does make use of some of the information that's in the access plan just to make the process faster, um, but really um, of very little use. Um, I was kind, kind of hoping that someday they may actually just get rid of it, of keeping that access, because it does cause other problems. Because um, you may notice that if you switch do things like have uh, static uh, SQL and you're switching your library lists a bit, you notice your program size starting to get bigger. So watch out for that one. Okay, I think I've, I'm, I'm done there, guys. Uh, I will get a new version of the handout uploaded uh, very, very quickly, like within the hour. So sorry about that. I think when I generated, I forgot to put in the hidden pages. Um, so um, if anybody does have any other questions uh, with that, uh, please feel free to drop me an email. Uh, you will be hearing from uh, Dan and Aaron uh, in, in, uh, in the next day or so, and they will give you information about handouts and, and all of that as, uh, as well. And, um, and you have Dan's email on the front of my slides as well if you do need to uh, to contact Dan. Okay, so that's it, everyone. Um, thanks a million for tuning in. Dan, Aaron, uh, thank you uh, for an excellent presentation, as always. And um, uh, unless you guys have anything to say. No, no just the thanks, Paul, appreciate it. And thanks everybody for sitting in. But thank cool. you all. Okay, so without further ado, folks, I am going to, uh, end there and uh thanks for tuning in everybody and hopefully catch you all at the next one bye 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 everybody bye